evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Raising Bulls, brought to you by the Beautiful Game Network and Rough Neck Scarves. We are the only podcast dedicated to the New York Red Bulls 2 of USL Championship tonight. It's a solo show. I got nobody to help me out this week. <laughs> Josteen is on vacation, and Bill uh, continues to gallivant around. Uh, so it's just me. We're going to keep it brief. We're going to talk about the loss to Indy 11. We're going to talk to recent returnee to the New York Red Bulls 2, Sean McSherry. And we're going to preview this Friday's match, Friday the 13th, with a full moon and dollar hot dogs against Charlotte Independence. Let's uh, let's start at the beginning. I, uh, I'm really excited today. Well, I guess yesterday, rather. I released my third album in the last three years. It's Acoustic Boomerang, uh, as always. And this one's called Anywhere, Everywhere, Gone. I mentioned it on the show a few times. It is out now. You can listen to it on all of your major streaming services and wherever you get your music. Go out there, listen to it. I'm excited about it. I'm still uh, uh, excited that I'm able to put out music on a regular basis. And uh, I hope you people out there uh, give it a listen. If you do, give me some feedback. I'll gladly accept the beating or uh, praise that you wish to dole out. And, uh, yeah, we'll take it from there, I guess. This match against Indy 11, a little bit disappointing. Red Bulls, I think, uh, probably looked at this match as a tough contest coming in. And rightfully so, Indy 11 has been really, really strong over their last, you know, two months or so. They've kept pace. They have games in hand. This was a really... A, a sort of defining moment for the season for the Red Bulls too. a defining uh, victory would have uh, essentially not, not entirely locked up the East for them, but it, it would have put them in a very good position to win the East. They drop the match, a single goal scored by Dane Kelly at the 83rd minute is, you know, the story of this one. But if you look at everything the Red Bulls 2 did in this match, they really could have gotten a victory. They held uh, advantage on uh, shots taken, 20 over uh, to 7, 5 on target against 3. They outpossessed. Their, the biggest thing is their accuracy. 25% of their shots made it on target. You're not going to win a match when that happens. There was absolutely some bright spots. I think Matthias Jorgensen uh, played well in this one. Tom Barlow struggled a little bit. We haven't really seen him get back to the form that I think we're used to uh, from him. It's not terrible, but he's certainly not quite at the level he was at uh, ahead of signing his MLS contract. If you read our um, sort of thoughts on the match at RBNN, Eric Friedlander, who, oh, I forgot to mention, we're going to do an Academy preview with him later on. Um, he mentioned that Tom Barlow's form is dipped. It's not, you know, a a terrible dip in form. He still has uh, a, a th- you know, three goals in the last little over a month of matches, but he hasn't played as frequently. Uh, the goal that he scored against Pittsburgh, was kind of a fluky one where there was a a uh, giveaway right to him and he was able to put it away. So, you know, we haven't seen him getting into spots and scoring the goals that we're used to pretty much since the Bethlehem Steel match. And I don't think that that's a, a sign that Tom is, is on the decline or anything's wrong. But, you know, it, it's just worth noting that right now he's misfiring. It sort of mirrors what we've seen with the first team. They're misfiring as well. I don't think we need to uh, freak out about it, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on as the season winds down, as they get closer to the playoffs. They are one of the highest scoring teams in the league, and uh, you want to see that continue. You want to see that momentum continue heading into the playoffs. So just you know, keep an eye on that as we, as we head down the final stretch. And chances on target. This team has always been a great at creating chances. They get you know anywhere between. 20 and 30 shots a match, especially at home. We see that in this one. It's just making sure that they get them on target. There was a a couple of moments earlier in the season, especially at the beginning of the year, I think about that Swope Park match uh, where the offense was misfiring a little bit. So hopefully they they are able to correct that and get back in form. Another thing I want to talk about with um, Tom Barlow and Matthias Jorgensen, there was a moment this match that I think 
uh, echoes back to way, way back to when they played Loudoun United at the beginning of the year. Uh, there was a moment in that match. It was, I think it was, I think they were down two to one at the time. Tom Barlow on a breakaway. He and Matias Jorgensen are running into the box. That's the setup for this in, in the Latin United match. Barlow takes the shot, misses the far post, and Matias Jorgensen, uh, or Jorgensen, I'm sorry, I have been saying Jorgensen again, uh, you know, voiced his frustration and showed his frustration that Tom didn't slide him the pass. Um, we, we saw some fallout from that and it ended up being a good thing because it sort of forced the issue in terms of, of Jorgensen kind of you know, getting his frustrations out at playing with the two team and, and kind of, you know, settling in and, and putting his head down and doing the hard work. Well, in this match, that moment crops up again. Sean McSherry, tonight's guest, plays a beautiful ball into Tom Barlow. Barlow, rather than uh, dribble in and take the shot, attempts to cross for Jorgensen. It is not on target. It's it's a little bit high. It's about knee level and in front of him. He's not able to get to it, and the chance goes begging. And it was just like an interesting parallel between those two moments because earlier in the season, you know, as we mentioned, if that uh, if he if Barlow passed in that situation uh, against Loudon, maybe he doesn't pass against Indy Eleven, or if he scored that that goal against Loudon, maybe he he attempts to score on this one. Uh, it's just something interesting to look at. Nothing that um, I think will will manifest further down the line, but who knows? You never know. Uh, the other thing I think is worth talking about. Jean-Christophe Kofi had a really nice match in the midfield. Uh, some terrific passing. Yeah, good defensive work. I think, you know, we when we've talked about him heading into the season, we weren't sure what he was going to be. We've mentioned that on the show a number of times. Is he a 6? Is he an 8? Is he a 10? Um, when he was on the show, he told us that he's really trying to settle in and be a 10. Uh, we think that's terrific. But the biggest part of that is finding ways to sort of make your presence known defensively in this match. He's got five tackles, two clearances, two block shots, great work. Um, And from that, that midfield trio uh, of, you know, um, Kofi Lemma and um, Vincent Bezicourt in this one, he leads all of those guys in all three of those, um, those stats. The only player on the team that uh, was able to have more clearances than him was Sean Nealis, which I think is, you know, a terrific sign again about the kind of work that he was able to put in on the night. Um, I could be wrong. Wait, hold on. Let me, let me check the other defenders. Yeah. He, he led all defenders and tackles. He was second in clearances. He, he did a really terrific job on the day. Uh, so great job to see Kofi continue to sort of grow and learn within the system. These are great signs, and I think it's going to really pay dividends down the line. And then the last thing I want to ha- talk about, Evan Loro. Evan Loro in the match, again, another terrific performance. The few times that Indy 11 got through, Loro was, you know, stood tall in net. Um, I think all year we've seen him get better in terms of, you know, picking his spots when he comes out to make those kinds of saves being in position. It's a little unfortunate on the goal, uh, that he's unable to do anything about that. Um, but I think we're seeing a lot of continued growth from Evan, especially over the last three seasons. And if he continues to do so, I think it's only going to be a matter of time before you know, we're talking more seriously about him uh, and Ryan Mara sort of competing to take over for Luis, Luis Robles when he's ready to move on. And that's, that's a great thing for the team overall. Uh, I, that's who I'm giving my man of the match to, Evan Loro. Uh, I think Kofi is probably another worthy recipient, but I'm going to give it to Loro this time around. And that is it for our first segment. We're going to take a break now. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Sean McSherry. So stick around. And 
And we're back. We are joined now by first year midfielder, defender. He was out for a little while. He's back now. Came back with a bang, I would say. It's Sean McSherry. How you doing, Sean? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, I, I would imagine you're doing very well considering you were out for a long time. You didn't have a lot of chances to play before that. Uh, you come back, you score two goals, you get involved. You, you you probably could have had an assist in the in the game against Indy, but you know things didn't quite work out that way. Uh, mm-hmm. How how's everything been so far this year? Uh, it's been great. I mean, uh, adjusting to a new team is obviously not super easy, but all the guys on the team have been super helpful, super nice. So it's been a great adjustment so far. And uh, you know, as you said, I had a tough injury, but uh, I finally come back, and it's it's nice to be back on the field. What was that like for you getting, getting injured early on when you first started to get minutes, uh, new team, like you said, and, and kind of adjusting to the environment? Uh, yeah. So the injury itself is, um, this was definitely frustrating. I, especially sprained ankles uh, are tough to deal with. And that was just my second sprained ankle that I ever dealt with. And it just happened to be a grade three sprain, which is, the worst you can get basically I could say. And, uh, you know, my trainer has been super helpful, um, getting me back on the field and the whole process took a little over three months. So it was a little overwhelming, but again, super, super happy to be on the field. I'll tell you what, when, when we were watching that game, uh, I thought you must've broken something. It looked really, really bad. Did you think that the injury was worse than it was or, yeah, I mean, you're still out for three months at that point. Uh, so I yeah. guess either way. Yeah, it's actually a funny story because when I was down on the ground, my tra- the trainer came on, Matt, and he was like, "What happened?" And I was basically, I just said to him, "My ankle's broken. Like, I need to get out of here. My ankle's broken." <laughs> and he was like, "All right, yeah, I'm gonna call a stretcher. Like, we'll get this taken care of." So my immediate thought when it happened is that my ankle was just shattered because it was I was in so much pain. Yeah, it, it definitely looked bad. Um, let, let's rewind to the the beginning of the the season, getting mm-hmm. drafted from Princeton. What was that experience like? Did you know that the Red Bulls were looking at you? Were you one of the guys who participated in one of those local combines? Uh, yeah, I was invited to the local combine before the uh, initial MLS combine, and I think they had their eyes on me for a little bit, and I, they saw me player like uh, quite a few times so i think i was on their radar and uh obviously it all worked out did you have discussions with the team at at any point uh, ahead of the draft no i didn't actually so i had no idea at the time that they were that interested in me but you know when it happened i was obviously super excited did you follow the team beforehand um, a decent amount, but not as much as, you know, I'd like to say, um, <laughs> you, but, you can lie here, Sean. It's fine. You can say you're the big, <laughs> a big fan. <laughs> oh yeah. I was the number one fan. I went to every single game. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, but you had some idea of what to expect coming in. Yeah. Cause you, you were in that combine. Uh, yeah, no, I had some idea. It was actually quite difficult for me because, a lot of the players who came into the combine who had already graduated. So, you know, a lot of their sights were set on the MLS already. And for me, um, coming from Princeton, it was a little more difficult and overwhelming because I was still in school while this was happening. So when I was initially drafted, I had to balance, you know, playing for the team and still being part of school. So I would, commute from Princeton to practice Oof. like every other day. So it, it was difficult at the time. And that's why I think I struggled for playing time in the beginning because my mind wasn't fully there. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. That's a, a heck of a ride to, to be making on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. It was like an hour, hour 15. It was not easy, but yeah, glad I did it. <laughs> Cause he, I think about South, I guess you can't exactly say South Jersey for, for Princeton, but I'm going to say South Jersey. Yeah. So you think about the two areas that you really don't want to have to commute to 
that sort of newer Harrison, uh, oh, yeah. uh, th- uh-huh. th- th- Parsippany, like all those areas are really tough. And Princeton is just a nightmare with traffic <laughs> during the day. Yeah. Oof. I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you stay sane through that? What were you doing during that commute? Uh, you know, I was listening to a lot of music. Um, I actually li- downloaded a lot of audio books yeah. to keep myself sane, but it wasn't all great. I had a couple of road rages here and there. Yeah, I, I, I bet. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. let's rewind even before Princeton. Yeah, you grew okay. up in Freehold, right? So what was your earliest uh, soccer experience? Um, well, I mean, when I was younger, I played every sport you can really think of. And uh, I would say I was a pretty gifted athletic person. So when I was playing sports, it wasn't too hard for me, but once I became, you know, above average in soccer, I started to realize that, you know, this sport is something that I really love to play. And I played for my town team here in Freehold for God knows long, maybe 12 years before I even switched to playing to academy in my junior year of high school. So I was quite attached to the friends I made in my, my childhood. So you what you were playing like uh, first rec and then like inter county, yeah, basically something like that. So I when I was playing um, younger, I never really pictured playing at the level that I'm playing at right now. So when, when did you first realize that that was even a possibility? Um, MLS or like college? I, I guess I'm either. Sure. Like when did it, when did you start to see a professional path uh, in your playing? Um. I would say probably around sophomore year. I came into high school playing lacrosse and soccer, and uh, I had to make a big decision my sophomore year whether to continue playing lacrosse or soccer. And obviously, I chose soccer because I felt like it would help me get into, you know, a better academic and athletic school, which I guess it did. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> understatement right <laughs> yeah so i mean it all worked out in the end but giving up lacrosse was was definitely uh a tough moment for me but again it all worked out fair fair um i i, I can guess why you would choose princeton because of the acclaim of the university mm-hmm. Uh, but was there something that drew you there besides uh just sort of its history uh the, the program itself yeah um Actually, funny as well. My, uh, I have an older brother who um, went to Princeton as well, but he was he was the first to ever go, and he was on the soccer team as well. So he had a large influence on my recruitment process. And uh, at first, I didn't want to follow in his footsteps and go to the same school he did, but you know, I saw all the friends he made, and I was already kind of close with the team, so it just kind of made sense. And it's it's really not that far from Freehold. I mean, I, I guess it's a little bit of a travel, but it, it, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty not close. too bad at all. Did that make it a little bit easier too with the decision, just like having that safety net? Uh, yeah, no, that made it helpful because my parents always wanted to see as much games as possible, and you know, if I went too far away, that would be difficult for them. Yeah, and I think that was another challenge as well as determining whether or not I wanted to be far away and go to school like away from home but uh i think going to school close to home was definitely helpful in adjusting to the college life and, you know my athletic career and how much older is your brother uh he's four years older than me oh so by the time you got to college he was kind of on his way out yeah so he was a senior when i was a freshman and uh, I rode the bench my freshman year, so unfortunately we didn't really get to play that much together. <laughs> Fair. What what position did he play? Uh, he played uh, like an eight, like a right mid. He he was actually pretty good, and uh, he almost went to the MLS Combine as well, but I think something fell through there. Fair. Were you guys competitive growing up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. There was not a, a game or a sport that we didn't, go at it <laughs> what was what was uh i guess the most competitive sport for the two of you was it soccer yeah absolutely we actually have um this small like soccer field set up 
in our basement that we used to play for hours on end. We play a two touch game and it, 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 I don't feel like explaining it, but basically we would get really heated. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Whoever lost, we would just, we would not talk to each other for days. <laughs> my my brother and I growing up, I also uh, have a four year separation with my brother and we would play what we called cellar football. So we had like yeah. about 10 feet of space to play this in. It was a concrete mm-hmm. floor. There was tackling. Yeah. It almost always ended in tears or fighting of some kind. Yeah. So I, I'm aware I've had those sorts of situations. Yeah, no, nah, that's that's where the, the brotherly love comes in. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this season so far, I, maybe it wasn't quite what you were expecting, but it seems mm-hmm. like you've got some forward momentum uh, at this point. You know, with the team doing so well, what are your expectations for the rest of the season? You know, uh, we we don't want to get our um, you know sights too far, but uh, we we really feel like we have a good chance of winning the. The USL Championship. I mean, we're in first place right now, and you know, I think we have six games left, and all all decent challenges ahead of us. But I, I really think we have a good chance of holding that first place spot going into playoffs. So, I mean, as long as we keep this momentum of of gaining three points every other game, or you know, five out of the six games left, we really have a good chance. That would be excellent. And I think a lot of people around here who've been following this team for a while will be very excited to see some playoff soccer at MSU. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that that happens. Sean? uh, Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was just saying I'm really looking forward to the playoffs. It'll it'll definitely be a higher intensity than the regular season. So, Yeah, definitely. I hope that, well, I hope that we get a better result, but I think that 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 game against mm-hmm. uh, Indy was probably a good indicator of, you know, what we're going to see in the playoffs uh, between those two sides, which I think should be very exciting. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep. Uh, before we let you go, I'm going to have to subject you to the lightning round. Are you ready? All right. Okay. Yeah, let's let's do it. <laughs> Popcorn, yes or no? Yes. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Super Mario or Sonic the Hedgehog? Super Mario. Who is your favorite team to play as in FIFA? Barcelona. And uh, I, I'm still going to call this the Derek Etienne Award, even though he's moved on to Cincinnati. Who is yeah. the worst dancer on the New York Red Bulls 2? Oh, oh God. <laughs> uh I would probably have to say Jared Stroud. Jared Stroud. I think this is a, a, a back-to-back week for him, so that's really exciting. Oh, it's a poor dancer. <laughs> oh, it's excellent. This is going to be yeah. uh, a heated race coming down the stretch as we, we talk to everybody else on the team, and uh, I, I'm definitely going to give out an award at the end to uh, whoever whoever gets that. So look, look forward to yeah. that, Sean. I look forward to it as well. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, We wish you nothing but the best of luck on Friday the 13th against Charlotte Independence. And when we come back, we're going to preview that match. So stick around. And we're back. We're going to preview the match against Charlotte Independence now. Uh, their head coach, Mike Jeffries, he took over midseason after, I don't know, man, I can't remember the first guy's name, uh, a Gaelic soccer coach. He came to the independence. They were going to be, uh, looking to kind of change their identity and that sort of didn't go over well. Uh, and their form absolutely suffered at the beginning of the season. There are five, 12 and 11 overall. They've got a negative 14 goal differential. They're 0, 5, and 9 on the road. They are winless in their last five and potentially worse than that. Uh, I'm going to do a quick check. The last time they won a game was on July 13th. So definitely not great. In that time, they have lost matches against... Tampa Bay Rowdies, three and one, or three to one. They drew against Charleston Battery, zero zero. They lost three to one to Indy Eleven, and three to one to Nashville LC. Got a pattern happening here. Three three 
against Loudoun United. That was a draw, obviously. Um, their last win, when I mentioned July 13th, that was over St. Louis FC, so another team that, that really was struggling and has been struggling. Um, I'll get to them in a minute. They're, they're starting to turn stuff around now. They look like they might be able to make a playoff push, but uh, in July, they certainly were not. So Charlotte, not the best. As I said, on the road, they are 0, 5, and 9. That's, I mean, it just doesn't get a whole lot worse than that. Their top goal scorer, Dominic Oduro, former Red Bull, he's got seven goals on the season. Then Jorge Herrera with six, Nicky Jackson with four, Andrew Gutman, who I believe is no longer with the team. Uh, he's got three. Enzo Martinez has three. Abdullah Mansali, former Revolution player, he's got two. Hugh Roberts, two. Kevon George and Valentin Sabella and Aaron Mond each have one. Their top assisters, Enzo Martinez, we know all about him. The Martinez brothers are still doing their thing down in Charlotte. They've got six and five apiece, Enzo and Alex. Then Mansali, Joel Johnson, Afrim Taku, and Dominic Aduro and Jorge Herrera all have two apiece. Then Isaac Enking. Jake Araman and Andrew Gutman. Like I said, I don't think he's with the team anymore. Each have one. You know, the chances are all mostly being created by the Martinez brothers. 48 for Enzo, 36 for Alex. So when you talk about a good way to stop uh, Charlotte, shutting down those two guys is a big part of that. The team likes to sort of try to press. They do not defend well. Uh, when they've got to defend with the ball on the ground, especially the low crosses in and around the box. Earlier in the season, uh, the Red Bulls were able to get a 2-1 win in Charlotte. I think both of those goals were scored by Tom Barlow. I'd have to go back and check. Um, If memory serves, that was the match that had a very, very long assist from uh, former New York Red Bull 2, Marcus Epps. He's with Memphis now. Uh, he sent a, a deep, deep ball in. Barlow rose to the challenge, looped it over the keeper, and I believe his second goal in that match came from a, a low cross from Jared Stroud. A typical type of play between those two guys that we've seen many times this season. I think when you look at you know just the form of Charlotte and uh, the form of New York, and especially the form at home, all the writing on the wall for this one is that this should be a slam dunk uh, for the Red Bulls. One thing to keep an eye on, uh, Edgardo Rito was hurt. That's how Mick Sherry ended up in the in the match the other day. Uh, he looked to get sort of an ankle sprain. We do have an update on his condition. Um, John Wolnick says that it was a contact injury. It was kind of an ankle sprain. Uh, he took a bunch of days off. He played today, so he looks good and sharp. Uh, so we think he's going to be okay. Um, Wolinek also said uh, on Charlotte, they're a good team. They have talent. They have been a problem for us in the past uh, with some of those guys. There certainly is going to have to be a high level of concentration and be able to take away some of their attacking threats. The guys I mentioned were Enzo and Alex, obviously. They've given up some goals, but uh, have been getting better and showing some better results back there. I think he's being too kind, honestly. So changes, we'll have to figure it out. Uh, We've been pretty good at creating stuff for ourselves. You know, coming off the last game, we just have to have confidence to take our chances as well. And that's the biggest thing, uh, the group confidence. And I think Red Bulls 2 is full of that. Having one bad result against Indy, I don't think is really going to change that. Um, You do have to look at the last five and say, okay, they lost to Pittsburgh. They lost Indy 11. You know, the teams that, are under them in the table. Um, they've been able to handle so far this year. Nashville, uh, they recently were able to defeat, but their two losses were against Pittsburgh and Indy. Those are both teams that are kind of sneaking up the table. Really aren't that f- far behind in the standings. Uh, so you want to see New York get results against better teams and uh, not overlook the teams further down the table, like Charlotte Independence. Maximizing points at home is going to be a big part of this. I want to see Sean McSherry get another run out, not just because he was our guest today, but I think uh, he showed very well. He has those uh, good midfielder instincts, kind of like Janusz Luba, uh, but we need to see him be able to put that together and do it on uh, sort of a, a 
uh, more regular basis, a consistent basis, and with the defensive wherewithal to kind of uh, take care of anything that gets behind them. We could also see uh, Kyle Duncan play in this game if he's back from U23s. I'm not sure 100% that he will be. Uh, but because I think their last game was Friday that he should be, or sorry, their last game, uh, I should just look this up. United States U23. Oh, okay. You can't just give me a schedule, huh? Thanks, Google. Thanks for nothing. Uh, okay. I'm not sure. They should be back as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'll be surprised if we don't have Kyle Duncan available, but we will see. Um, the other guy that I want to see more of, Jean-Christophe Kofi, I think is getting to a spot where uh, his play has been at an outstanding level. So I hope we continue to see him. I think given the circumstances, as much as I love Vincent Bezicourt, I would rather see Kofi, Lima, and Zayats kind of taking up those three midfield positions and Bezicourt, uh, I know he's getting back to full fitness, but I want to see him uh, play more of a role with the first team and, and sort of filling in where he can there and give the the um, give the opportunities to those other guys who are still sort of up and coming. Especially, I mean, Lema at the top of the, the midfield diamond has been very, very good this year. He's leading New York, uh, or I guess maybe Jared Stroud's actually leading. Let's check that too. I'll fact check. See, when I don't have another host, I have to uh, <laughs> fact check during the show. Um, so, But I, I like what Lem has been able to do at the top. He hasn't had as many assists, six compared to Jared Stroud's eight. Uh, but I think he, he can do some really nice things up top. Uh, he is second on the team in chances created with 73. He and Jared Stroud, of course, leading the way there. So I'd like to see Lemma back up top, Stroud on the wing, maybe Bed Mines on the wing too. I think, you know, he deserves some shot. Uh, we know that he's capable, but if they want to go sort of a more two forward, uh, system, then maybe we see somebody who's a little bit more defensive minded, uh, take up that spot. We're, we're going to have to wait to see, especially if, if Rito is good to go or not uh, heading into this match. The first team plays on Sunday in Seattle, so I don't think you're going to see a lot of overlap in terms of personnel. If Brian White is available and ready to travel with the first team, uh, then I think you'll still see Barlow with the second team and probably Jorgensen. If he's not, then I would expect to see um, maybe Sebastian Elney get another start. Uh, with one of those guys. I don't think they're going to take both uh, Jorgensen. I said Jorgensen again. Jorgensen and Barlow, uh, if Brian White's injured, I think that you'll see only one of those guys. So whoever stays behind that will be the starter uh, up top with Elney, should that occur. Uh, the rest of the field, I think we've got a pretty good handle on who that will be. Nealis and Kilwine have played well together. I really like what we've gotten from Jordan Scarlett, although he seems to be seeing a little bit less time right now. Uh, I don't know if that's by design or, um, you know, just kind of rotating minutes based on uh, the players available. I know now Nealis is sort of um, seen as a first team guy, but he's been continuing to come down and fill in again on the, on the second team. I don't expect to see Tarek again. I think that was a sort of a one-off chance. And uh, yeah, Loro in goal. All of the things in mind and what I expect, I'm going to say that this should be a easy 2 nothing win. Um, you know what? Actually, I'll give them a 3-1 win just because of uh, the, the pattern that they've developed, uh, Charlotte, that is, in their losses recently. Now we're going to take another break. When we come back, we're going to do a preview of the Red Bulls Academy for the 2019 Academy season with Eric Friedlander. So stick around. And we're back. Final segment time. It, it's not me alone anymore. I, I talked to Sean McSherry for a little bit. Then he had to deal with me talking about uh, this match against Charlotte. And now for the first time ever on this show, it's Eric Friedlander. Hello, Eric. How are you? 
Good, good. I like the joke that I'm trying to get on every Red Bull podcast, but it's a lot easier to get on every Red Bull 2 podcast because there's only <laughs> one. <laughs> so I, I checked Red Bull 2. Every Red Bull, no one started any more Red Bull 2 podcasts. That's it. That's, you've heard it here, guys. Go out and start uh, a ton of Red Bull 2 podcasts. I think you should do that anyway uh, because this team deserves uh, more people talking about it. But uh, do it but just, then invite me as a guest. <laughs> that's right. Or don't invite him because then it'll be completely maddening that you're not on those shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you published, I would say, a short, a very tiny little piece about Red Bull's <laughs> Academy today. It was just over 2,000 words, probably. Uh, it was close to 2,400. There you I think. go. <laughs> I, I actually, I don't usually do this, but I copy and paste it into Word just to see how many words hey, it was. I feel like you could probably do that in WordPress. I'm sure there's a way. Maybe I haven't figured it out. <laughs> I'm, I'm a WordPress novice. Ah, all right. Yeah, then I will pretend like I'm an expert. There's definitely a way. And uh, geez, Eric, pick up the, the slack. You yeah. Know, get out there. Uh, but, uh, you know, give me a little breakdown. Give me a state of the academy. Where are we in 2019? I know that. So much of the talk, I think, that we saw early in the year was kind of about uh, the state of flux within the academy and other teams maybe catching up and the talent level maybe not being where it was. But I just want to get your idea of, of where you see the groups uh, heading into this season. So I think it should be kind of a bounce back year. So where we left it last year, the, only the U19s made the playoffs and the U17s made the, were in the showcase, which everyone gets invited to. So that was very disappointing because at the U19 and U17 levels, you have an expanded playoff field. U15, they were probably one of the better teams. They made the Ryder Cup, Generation Adidas Cup for U15 level, which was a good accomplishment and kind of set them as like a top five, top four almost MLS academy at that level. So I'm not too worried about missing the playoffs there because there's only like four, it's like an eight-team tournament. So it's very small. But U17 and U19 have an expanded field where I think like close to 20, 30 teams almost make it into the playoffs. So not making it into that field is was disappointing for the U17. So U17 should have a really good bounce back year. And U19s, it will be tougher this year because entering this season, they reshaped the U19 division. So they put all the MLS teams in the top division and relegated a lot of the independent teams, which didn't make a lot of independent teams happy because a lot of them are actually better than MLS Academy, especially on the West Coast. That was a big controversy. The East Coast is not as big of a deal. So unlike in past years, we're now in a division with New York City FC, DC United, Philadelphia, New England, and I uh, think that's about it. And then like PDA is in there who are consistent power and mm -hmm. then Baltimore Ar Armor and Bethesda, which also I think Sebastian Elney played for Bethesda in his time in high school. Yeah, so. I think that's right. Uh, what was it about last year that made it, uh, you know, sort of a down year for the team? I think one part is they were very undermanned coaching wise. They had a few coaches started moving out. There were rumors of some disagreements between the higher level coaches at the clubs of so the first, second team coaches and some of the academy coaches. Of when David Longwell joined, he tried to change some things. So that didn't, his vision didn't really jive. And that's why you saw him get moved out within a year. So after he got moved out in November and then the, Dennis was kind of just handling the administrative stuff as well with the administrators there. So they kind of reshaped their whole structure of the academy this year. They split up the business and the coaching. So they brought in Sean McCafferty, who has a lot of experience in this area and in America. So I think that's a big difference from Longwell. Longwell was kind of still relatively new to America and soccer. He just was, he was at Orlando City, and then he was in Europe prior to that in England and Scotland, I believe. So McCafferty moved to America like 20 years ago and worked his way up through FC Delco, who was one of the top independent academies in Pennsylvania, in kind of like the Philly, Pennsylvania area. And 
they actually just hired Jeff Zahn as their new academy director, former Metro star and Red Bull Academy coach. And then he moved out to Barca Academy to kind of launch their whole residency program. So that's kind of part of the reason why he is coming here is because he has that background with a residency program. So that's probably the direction they're headed in. And then having a business guy allows him to just focus solely on the soccer, on the coaching, which I think will free him up and allow him more growth from the coaching staffs and the players. So it's fair to say that McCafferty's signing is probably the most significant one of the summer window for the Red Bulls organization in America. Yeah, people won't like that. but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, from what I've heard, he's been impressive early on. I know he's been to Salzburg a few times already, including with the U15. So he's met with Jesse Marsh already and he's been able to, conference with him and talk with the people over there i believe with rolf rognick getting more involved we'll see leipzig people coming over here and they from what i've heard that may that should be happening within the few months so i would expect to see maybe at the nycfc academy game that's september 28th if people want to go i recommend going rampage yeah not, not only should you be on that but uh, let's let's push that up the organization as well. We should uh, get Viking and ESC involved as well. You guys should come out and even if it's just the, the U nineteen game, it's completely free. It's at the training facility, September twenty eighth, two p.m. It's good to see the future, and it would be kind of cool to give them a little atmosphere besides parents yelling instructions and yelling <laughs> at refs. Boot it! Despite it being a higher level. Youth soccer parents that are still youth soccer parents. And look, I, I understand the 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 pull to want to shout to your kids during the matches. But one, uh, speaking from experience, they don't hear you. And two, even if they do, they can't process your instructions fast enough. for My favorite the was, difference. so I was at the game against Baltimore Armor. And you have these Baltimore Armor parents who kept yelling, the switch is on. If you can get it, the switch is on, which... Everyone knows how the team press is. Right. The switch will be on. But it's kind of <laughs> like, it's not being switched for a reason. And it's not just because your kid's dribbling with his head down. Right, yeah. They're in their trap. They're getting pressed. They're not just willfully not switching it. And then it was also a 1-1 tie. And the ball went behind the bleachers. And a parent starts getting it. And another Baltimore Armor parent's like, why are you getting the ball? Like, hold on to it. Don't give it back. Oh, and I was like, it's a 1-1 tie. Don't you want to win? But <laughs> some of these lower DAs, it's when you're not, they're just kind of happy to hold on to that one point on the road, get it. It's like, what are you doing? Like, hey, it's not that serious. <laughs> anything to get a point. It's, these, yeah. are, these are big times. So, we're in. It would be cool to see the supporters come out for that. I highly recommend. It's a fun time. I would absolutely like to see that. The other uh, big change this year, so they've got Sean McCafferty. It looks like, you know, uh, they're going to be at least maybe changing up the formation in some cases and the tactics. But you also have a homestay program, which seems like it's starting to, I think, come into effect this season. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah so they launched a homestay. I think they kind of launched it a little late. They were piecing all to get the other, all the pieces together. I'm not sure it's really we'll see the effects of it until maybe winter or even next academy season because they're still as we, I think all the red anyone who's bought a Red Bull ticket has gotten an email from the team. They're still looking for parents or houses and families to host. So to me, that's kind of a sign that they haven't really got as many hosts and stuff at this moment. So I think they're still trying to build out their database of families and places to put players so i would expect to see that more maybe next year see the res that, the results of that and the fruit, the fruit of that is going to be a, a couple of years off i yeah. would imagine so especially since the homegrown territories haven't much rumored that they're going away but there aren't they haven't officially gone away maybe with the new cba that's something that happens i would think the player union may be for that because they're usually in favor of more player movement and that increases player movement. So yeah, that's something to look right? out for. But I think in a way you kind of just have to 
like the homestay player program's kind of a band aid and not really uh it's just kind of patching over that yeah we need a place we need to start getting into this but really what they need is to kind of go the Salzburg like if they really want to get to Ralph Rognick's view vision goal of multiple Tyler Adams coming from America and moving up to the Bundesliga in Salzburg you really need the kind of the full-on residency yeah you need not even that it has to be full-on residency because I think there's it's kind of a tough situation where you still have kids who are very good from New Jersey who live 30 minutes away. I don't think you have to force those kids to get out of their like parents' house or go live in this apartment. But I think having a much better facility, I think they'll, they're in line for an upgraded facility where you have dormitories, where you can house players and you have state of the art cafeterias and, Multi, even more fields and so what they have now is very good and when it was announced it was sta- like state of the art for the time but seeing some of the new facilities Atlanta has a really really nice facility where it's just shinier it's nicer there's a little more to it you look at Salzburg and Leipzig they have six fields right outside their indoor facility where they have their weight room and stuff but they also have dormitories in there they have Salzburg has indoor fields so that's kind of the next step. I don't. I remember Dyer, Christian yeah. Dyer, reported something about that. They're looking, yeah, for a new property. I don't. I don't have any official sources on it, but I definitely uh, overheard some some whispers about uh, that around. So I would say that that is a very likely thing to happen. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's more of a matter of time for when they'll yeah. announce anything with that. So that's kind of the next step. So this is the homestay, maybe. Like the more I thought about it, like I used to be a starch, you don't need residency, what the value of it is kind of iffy, especially in these vastly populated areas, densely populated areas. But the more I think about it, the more it's needed so you can attract the players from across the country and also just provide an even more professional experience with and a more integrated experience where maybe these kids are going to school at the training facility. And that's part of it. When they become U16, maybe they, their sophomore from their junior year on of high school, they're doing in class with teachers and stuff. So it's not straight homeschooling. It's kind of a combo where they go to school to 10 o'clock and then they come and take classes at the facility, but they get to practice at the same time as the first team. So you can easily pull a kid from one team to the next. Yeah, I think that that would be a big, big boon for this organization moving forward as the academy continues to to grow in importance uh, within the the sort of overall structure. And speaking of which, that brings us to where it will matter most for me and my show. Uh, Let's talk about the guys who we're starting to look at as maybe the next RB2 prospects. Obviously, the biggest one really right now is John Tolkien. But I mean, for all intents and purposes, he's an, he's a Red Bull two player. Would you agree with that? Yeah. For me, he's probably like, it's small sample size, but with Reese Buckmaster moving up to the first team, Tolkien is to me, the best left back on the team. I would start him. If he's fit, I'm starting him every game from here to the end of the season. There's, Really, I see no reason not to. Just well, from I, a developmental purpose, yeah. there he's good enough. He's proven against good teams. Nashville, he put in a really strong ninety-minute performance, and then against the lesser teams, Atlanta United, he showed his ability to influence the game on the ball. And his left foot is magical. Yeah, I will. I will agree that he's probably the best left back since Reese has left. I think Janos Luba has done a very nice job transitioning to that position, but you could still see where he's got room to grow. Yeah. Moving forward, he's been, I think, fantastic. But yeah, on the Tolkien to me, side, not so much smooth. Yeah, there's something. There's a very like calmness to his game where he gets on the ball and it, there's no panic. There's everything just looks natural, like it's just meant to happen how he wants it. Yeah, and I don't. I don't mean to. I'm not trying to cast aspersions at um, at Janusz Luba because I think 
I think athletically, he's probably ahead of Tolkien in terms yeah. of just uh, his use of his body and his speed and all of that. Uh, but, you know, sometimes what I have experienced is when I watch these young guys, the guys who have the most uh, uh, sort of athletic builds and uh, are the most natural athletes will sometimes s- have setbacks in their development because they've been able to rely on those natural tools without actually refining their game as much along the way. And I think that's where Tolkien probably benefits. Yeah. Um, who else are we talking about though? I know we've seen uh, Sal Esposito and Bryce LaBelle, but uh, who are the guys that you've got your eye on? So one person we haven't seen who could be, maybe uh, we see him in preseason camp in Arizona or wherever they go next year has, has been common with rebel Two like Academy players is, Diego Ribello. He's a was U seventeen last year, but he has three goals this year in two starts, three games. And he was someone I liked at the U seventeen level, but I haven't seen enough of him. He didn't play in the game I was at, or he didn't came off the bench in that game I was at this year. So I've only seen him sparingly at the U seventeen level. So I don't have a full picture of his game, but I kinda he's a technical dribbler, athletic has a clearly has a nose for the goal. So he's someone I'm interested in watching a little more and kind of seeing where he goes. Another person is Connor Maller. He's a Stanford commit center back. He played with, he has one appearance with Rebel Bull too. He came off the bench mm-hmm. late in a game. He could be someone that maybe not this year because the center back is well stocked back there, but maybe someone we kind of see preseason get a look at before he goes off to college he's going to a good place to develop the stanford as a yeah but he's probably someone maybe has a good four-year college career and then comes back to red bull too okay uh that makes sense and obviously that's one of those positions that we've seen a lot of turnover just over uh the last couple of years so it wouldn't surprise me to see them churn in some other bodies uh and what you had talked about uh, up top with Rebello, I think, you know, when we talk about the best prospects of the young guys who are kind of coming through the system right now, very few of them are developed in house. Yeah. And getting more of those players, I think, is going to be kind of critical uh, as yeah. this continues. There's been kind of a both of a drop off recently where we haven't had as many like clear, direct, these guys are homegrown ready right out of the academy. Obviously, we had Omar So, but he he joined in November. He's not really a Red Bull Academy product as much of a kind of a lucky find in a way that he just kind of panned out and then took the half a season on fire and earned himself a contract. But I wouldn't say he was a product of the system right. in the way that you can say Tyler Adams is a product of the system. Derek Etienne was a product of the system alex wheel product of the system so it's kind of different there but most of this team is players who have been in the system two three years so that may be their key to winning more this year okay who else uh who are the other players that you think uh maybe maybe not next year but are on the cusp of of getting looks so the big name that a lot of people have talked about is Dantuma Torre, Dantuma Yaya Torre. No one really knows how the nickname came besides the obvious. He's not a center mid. He's not ridiculously tall. So, <laughs> But Yaya is a lot easier to pronounce than Dantuma. So Probably, yeah. That may be why it stuck. He, was, he burst onto the scene as a guest player at the Next Generation Tournament in Austria two years ago, I think it was at this point now, maybe three. And he's a 2004, so at that time he was 13. <laughs> so, But he's very raw. Right. So he plays the game. There's a real, almost a violence to the game. This is a real interesting style. He's very aggressive. He's super quick. His straight line speed is ridiculous, and he burns past guys who are two years older and three years older than him. So his speed is really impressive and he's aggressive and he goes into tackles hard, but he's still kind of learning the nuances of the game. So that's why it's good that he's at the U19 level because he has the physicalness, physical 
size, his strength and speed, the play at that level. Now he's learning how can he can working on combining in the wide spaces, moving, hitting the one twos, running off a defender, being more clinical as a finisher once he beats a player. Kind of all the little things, how to press into the system, how to having that consistent work rate as well, being all in for 90 minutes. That's the next step. I think part of it, he's still a little rusty. He missed the whole year with a knee injury for the most part. So he just played his first 90 against DC United in like a year and a half. So it's still kind of a growing back into the game after being out that long. But there's definitely talent there. It may be that he's really a number nine and they're playing him on the wing to kind of develop those periphery skills. And then you move him back to a striker where you can take advantage of that straight line speed and his ability to get in behind and ride a tackle and get on goal. And then by having that experience on the wing, he's more well-rounded as a player. He can hold up the ball. He can bring players in and then run off of those plays. I I think there's something to be said for that too. And the idea that, you know, at 13 and 14 and 15, the way that you are in control of your body is constantly sort of changing as you're going through sort of bigger growth spurts uh, for those age levels. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how he develops uh, physically as well and his comfort and control. And if the aggressiveness uh, in tackles uh, can be, you know, sort of maintained and uh, cultivated so that yeah. he's doing it in the way that they want him to and not in a sort of reckless uh, abandon uh, yeah, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a reckless abandonment right but there's a certain like real aggressiveness like yeah it's hard to describe because it's like you watch him field level and you just he comes in fast and he comes in hard and he has his eye for the ball and he wins the ball but it's like wow that's a violent tackle even though it's like <laughs> completely clean Right. He's stealing the ball. There's really no like actual body to body contact, but there's a ferociousness to it. That's it's good. kinda that's, I, good. that's why I want people to come out to these games because it's pretty fun to see it and like see what you hear about these names, but to see it you kinda get a different appreciation. And the U nineteenth level is not bad. Like the standard of play, I've been watching listening to Josh Sims too much now. I say the standard. <laughs> <laughs> Which it still freaks me out that we're the same age. That oh, man, yeah. <laughs> scary. But the standard at the U19 level is not that bad, even compared to like European levels, Germany. Like you, you take top American U19 teams and put them in the Bundesliga U19 team league, and I'd be willing to bet that they hold their own, they'd be mid table, and the real top dogs, your top four teams, your Bayerns, et cetera. They boss those U19 leagues, your Shakas. They boss those U19 leagues anyway, but the middle tier of those, not much different than the U19 level here at the top. The, that's, uh, I, I guess, not entirely surprising because it's, it's yeah. really all about uh, where they're identifying those players and developing them. And, um, you know, I, I think when you talk about how weird it is for Josh Sims to be your age. You should know how weird it is for me to be interviewing 16 year old Tyler Adams. <laughs> <laughs> but at least there it's like, yeah, he's young. Like you get it. He's young for me. Josh Sims seems like he should be like 27. Maybe it's the full beard yeah, and that's like what it is. having such a complete life already that he's <laughs> like been his whole life is together. Like maybe that's it. <laughs> he's a professional soccer player. He's making tons of money. Yeah, it's like he's been a pro since eighteen. So maybe that's why he seems like yes, he's so, world hardened. Yeah. yeah, I don't feel the same way with Jorgensen. He's only like four years younger than me. But to me, like when I see him, I'm like yeah, that's still a kid. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. He definitely yeah it comes. It's off the more beard. It has to be the beard, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the new challenge. Everyone put beards on all of the young players, and we'll see if we think that they seem older because <laughs> <laughs> they have beards now. <laughs> uh, I don't. Some are going to be like me and can't grow, and you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean. I mean Photoshop them on. We don't oh. need to force them to grow. Beards. We need a Josh Sims beard app. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Face app the beards onto these players, guys. Uh, all right, give me two more players before we we kick out of here. So we'll go down to the U17s. So 
One second. So the U17s, they're kind of this team is kind of a mix where you have a few high level 2003s and a, some high level 2004s, and then you kind of have a, a mix of like a lot of players who are kind of I think getting felt out. They they brought in a, it's a pretty big roster. There's quite a few new players. They brought in some players from NYCFC, which we'll see how they pan out. I heard that maybe NYCFC cut a lot of their U15s. So who knows if it, how that will turn out. So it will be interesting to see how some of those players integrate from the existing U15s who moved up and joined some of the U17s. So we'll touch on a few. Keenan Hot. The cousin of Sachi Hot was he the first homegrown or one of the first? He was one of the first. He wasn't the first. The first I think Giorgio Chigurh. Yeah. yeah, Johnny Exantis got robbed. Yes, he sure did. <laughs> um, so he's the cousin of Sachi Hot. Has that like his dad played at Seton Hall back in the day when they were one of the top programs. So there's a obvious lineage of soccer playing in that family, but he was with the U15 national team, captained them for one of the games. They went on a good run this summer. It was a kind of a weird tournament, the U15 CONCACAF championship that invited Portugal, Slovakia, Israel as guest team, so it wasn't really CONCACAF. So they ended up losing to Portugal in the semifinal, and then Portugal, I think, won the tournament. So had a good summer there. He actually played some U23 soccer this summer with Jackson Lions, I believe. So that's like a good experience for such a young kid to be able to hold his own at that level. And what I've seen on the pitch, it's kind of showing another level of confidence. So I wrote that he'll benefit from the field kind of opening up, which at the U15 level, there's kind of this everyone still swarms the ball a bit. Yeah. And when you're kind of the, a higher intelligent player, someone who's played at, with top kids in the country at U15 and has played with college kids at U23, you're you kind of start you start thinking faster, you start playing faster, but not everyone else is playing faster and if your opponents are swarming, things get compacted and it's harder to kind of outthink your opponents. Mm-hmm. So I think the U17 level what I saw was even more confidence, a little more room to operate where he could take a player on and beat them and keep the ball moving. He was playing, we kind of skipped past the formation, but they were playing kind of a diamond and he was playing that kind of deep line playmaker holding six role, but with a little utility to move up. And the Academy account posted his goal from the first game against Bethesda, which was was a really nice goal. Yeah. The DA needs to adjust that on their website. They credited it to a player, a different player. Who they give it? Uh, Who they give the credit to? They gave it to kid Gavin to BJ. Ah, Gavin, come on, you gotta so step they, up and and uh, they need to adjust the record because there's <laughs> video evidence. But he also scored again. He scored a penalty kick and had the game winning assist off a free kick against DC United this past weekend. So he's playing with some swagger now, and he. I think he's someone who could make the jump towards the end of the year and maybe see some minutes with U19 based off how their season going. U19, it's common for some players to kind of drop off at the end of the year if they're going to college, just kind of disappear. So he's someone who could maybe, as a 2004, make the jump. Another is John Carlos Cortez. He was also on that U15 team. He's a very solid left back. Should help press in the left can offer service, good athleticism. He's someone I think, based off how he grows, if he gets to like being six one, six two, he could end up maybe transitioning over to like a ball playing left sided center back as well. He kind of has played some of that at the U fifteen level. Yeah, I was gonna say six one is big for a left back, but yeah, he's not there yet. I haven't seen him up close, but I would say he's probably like five seven, five eight now as a two thousand four. So he has good size already at his age. Same thing with Keenan. He's kind of big kid for his age. And then two others I want to focus on. One is Thomas Tolger. He is rapid, really, really quick kid. And he's someone he's another one who could maybe make that jump to U nineteen 
before his like U19 season. So he's a 2003 burst. So this is his last U17 season. So he, someone kind of on that board, he was injured at the first part of last year. But when he was a U15, he scored something like 26 goals as a U15. 28 goals as a U15 in 2017, 2018. And then last year he battled some injuries, but had a pretty good showcase where he scored two goals in the showcase. So he's someone who's looking to kind of break out this year with the U17s. He's really quick. He's technical on the dribble area. He's pretty strong. He has a nice bulky build, so he can hold defenders off and beat people one-on-one. So he, He's someone that will look out for at the U17 level if he just needs to get his finishing back, like the confidence back. Because he scored a nice goal against Bethesda, had a breakaway against Baltimore Armor that he probably should have put away, but it was a nice save by the goalie. But he's someone I'm excited to watch more because he's absolutely rapid and has a good understanding of the movements and how to play the game. And And who's your last guy that we're going to talk about before we get out of here? So the last one, I think this is going like kind of young, 2005, Serge Goma. He's kind of a more of a keep an eye on him for maybe in two years, three years, have that name in mind. But he kind of he had a really solid season with the U15, scored something like 12 goals. And then he's now playing with the U17s as a 2005. So but some kids are two years older than him at this level. But he kind of reminds me a little bit of Mason Toy. As like I grew up in the same town as Mason Toy, so I saw him at like soccer camps and stuff. So I, when he was similar age and like low middle middle school entering high school type of age, like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, very athletic, super athletic kid, but still kind of learning the game, learning how to move and make runs and get a little better at technically finishing stronger on the ball off the ball sort of thing and i see a lot of similarities in that sense that very athletic kid too athletic really to be playing u15 so moving up to u17 allows him to play against stronger faster kids who will challenge him more than maybe a u15 defender that he can just sprint straight past so i'm interested to see how he develops learning the game and kind of playing against stronger opposition. So that's kind of a lookout for his name, maybe in two, three years as potential RB2 player. Eric, this has been absolutely fantastic. I would be remiss if I ended this without subjecting you to the lightning round. Oh, yeah. I've been preparing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I got two questions (laughs) you have absolutely not been preparing for. So here we go. Popcorn, yes or no? Movie theater only. Oh, my God. That's the worst popcorn. <laughs> but it's so addicting. <laughs> the smell. It's wonderful. Oh, God. That's awful. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Marvel or DC? Uh, Marvel. Every day. S- Super Mario or Sonic the Hedgehog? Uh, never played really either, but... Oh, you're so... Young. I always, I always kind of like Sonic. I'll go Sonic. Uh, if I have to hear you talk about how you can't believe how old you feel with Josh Sims being the same age as you, and then at the same time, See, hearing you say I, you've never well, played actually, Mario or I played Sonic. Mario Kart. I oh, played right. a lot of Mario Kart. So I guess a Mario, but I never used him. I was a Toad person because they uh, had yeah. the super fast powder up thing. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, GameCube, that was like my GameCube game, that and FIFA 06. <laughs> Wait, wait, what year were you born? Were you 97? Oh, man. So, yeah, uh, the year that I coached, uh, I had kids your age. And uh, I remember saying to them, because I was working for a video game publisher at the time, and I was really excited because I was working with uh, an old school uh, developer that had done all these games. And I was mentioning them to the kids, and they were just like their eyes glazed over. And I was like, Haven't any of you ever played Nintendo? And a kid (laughs) said, I played an N64 once. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah i the yeah. only time i really played n64 was there used to be a place in the livingston mall where you could get your haircut and play video games at the same time and i didn't have like so i would get my haircut there and like play some n64 for like the 10 minutes my haircut took <laughs> <laughs> and then in college i played some mario kart on n64 very nice very nice okay who is your favorite team to play as in fifa oh uh, play as that's another tough one 
guess I'll go Manchester United, but it's not like I kind of just bounce around. So okay, All right, maybe fair. Wimbledon as well. When I'm playing someone really bad, just to mess with them. <laughs> You're appealing to the masses, Manchester and Wimbledon. <laughs> um, okay, this is this is the curveball. If you're ready for it, who is the best person on Red Bull Twitter, and who is the worst person on Red Bull Twitter? Oh, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, the best person's me. No. Oh man. <laughs> uh, the best is Red Bull's news network because oh boy, I all tweet from that. Now. That's uh, sort of a diplomatic response. I'll, I'll let you have uh, it. The worst. Uh, this is easy. Ron McCraff. Oh, uh, there you go. Yeah, I think that that's a well. <laughs> that's a winner. That's a winning upon. answer. Yeah. No one will get. <laughs> And he's, I have him blocked, so I can't lose. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Boom. think I've seen him tweet in a long time. But uh, I think he has a new account. I uh, think yeah. I blocked it as well. <laughs> Interesting. What do, what do you think the new account is? Uh, I forget. I have to. You have to ask. That's a question for Off the Perch Pod. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll get, I'll get in touch with them. Anyway, uh, where can people follow you on Twitter, Eric? Uh, at efreed97 and Red Bull News Network. RB News Network on Twitter. You can follow me at underscore Joe Goldstein and the show, and we we hope you follow the show at Raising Bull Cast. That's one bull Raising Bull Cast, and that's all on Twitter. We're at Facebook.com slash Raising Bulls. We're at RaisingBulls.com where we post all of our episodes. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us, rate us, review us. It really does help, guys. It helps with the algorithms. We're part of the Beautiful Game Network at BGN.FM. They cover MLS, USL, Premier League, and NWSL. They've got a ton of great shows like Rising is One, Mon Goals, Play the Kids, 1868 Weekly, Down in the Valley, and so much more. And that's just the USL stuff. They've got a ton of great podcasts, a ton of great written content. It's all at BGN.FM. And last but not least, we want to thank our sponsor, Roughneck Scarves, the official scarf supplier of MLS, USL, and U.S. soccer. Get custom scarves for your group or team at roughneckscarves.com. For myself, for Sean McSherry, and Eric Friedlander, thank you very much, and have a great night. Bye.